All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Coffee with the Freight Coach. My name is Chris Jolly. I am your host, and I am the Freight Coach. Before we jump into today's episode, as always, thank you guys so much for coming out and listening to this podcast. We're on an absolute roll with all this stuff. And if you follow my content, this is going to be the one-on-one interviews. This is going to be the in-depth why people got into the industry, the successes they've had, what they've learned, and putting out best practices from their perspective. Because at the end of the day, you guys, this is what this is all about. It's about education, insight, and most importantly, it's about information that you can apply and utilize and see a meaningful difference in your business. Um, I also have my daily live show where I break down industry headlines and provide actual tangible information of what you can do to kind of deviate you away from all the clickbait headlines that are out there that are, you know, not necessarily giving you the best information just based off of that. And, you know, at the end of the day, guys, it's why I fly the American flag behind me. I'm, I'm living my American dream and I want to help every, each and every one of you guys live your American dream, especially in the trucking industry where 97% of it is small business. Um, If this is your first time listening, welcome. This is the real side of freight. There is no sugar coating here. There's no theory. Nobody's trying to write a hit piece. These are all people who are active in the transportation industry to talk about best practices. Um, I do have one small favor to ask. If you're not subscribed, do me a favor, subscribe and share the show. Because if you see value in this, you guys, and you share that out with your network, chances are your network's going to see value in it as well. Um, I got a very special guest for you guys today. This is one of those uh, instances where I've literally just met this individual five minutes ago, and I can already tell I'm going to have a phenomenal conversation with him. He's a guy who clearly has a lot of passion for the trucking industry. So I have Mr. Steve Burroughs here today. He's a freight agency owner with SPI Logistics. He is a transportation professional through and through you guys. He has been on every single side of this industry. And we're here to talk about all of that fun stuff today. So Steve, thank you so much for joining me here. Hey, thanks, Chris. I appreciate the opportunity. No, man, it's uh, fantastic. I I appreciate you taking the time to to come out. And Steve showed me his pool. He's out there in in Florida right now. (laughs) Enjoying that Florida, man. What's funny, Steve? So, like living in Arizona, this is our summer now, right? Like now, when it turns to fall, and now we can start going back outside. <laughs> that's that's right. That's right. And it gets pretty hot here in South Florida, but uh, you know, I mean, we have we do have winter here in in South Florida. It lasts usually about 35, 40 minutes, and that's about it. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, yeah. In fact, there's a there's a lot of things going on in my office right now, and that's why I came out here and sat on the pool deck to have this conversation with you today. There's there's actually a, a conference going on with my team right now. Uh, mm-hmm. I've got agents kind of scattered across the country, and they're all having a big meeting right now. Oh, that's fantastic, man. So, Steve, what, what brought you into freight, man? What brought you into transportation? Well, I grew up in a little town in North Alabama of about 800 people. And uh, when I was growing up, you know, if, if you didn't work for the coal mines, you had to do something that was that was in support of the coal mines. And it didn't take very long to realize that, you know, all the coal truck companies running around, they need people to shag trailers and clean trailers out and things like that. And I learned how to drive a stick shift in a 79 cab over peak when I was 14 years old. And that was my start. I was hooked. Uh, I learned how to drive the trucks and then I learned how to back trailers and I was shagging trucks and trailers at 14, 15 years old, started driving at 17, 18. And, you know, I went to college. Uh, My degree is actually in uh, industrial engineering with an emphasis in logistics. So I'm really an anomaly in the business. I've got a CDL. I've got a degree that is in logistics that I actually use. (laughs) I've, I've been I've been vice president of operations in charge of logistics for steel companies. I've been corporate director of transportation for steel companies. At one time, I had a fleet of 125 tractors at my disposal and 250 trailers and used to kind of jet all around with this company. Uh, I've owned my own trucks. I've driven my own trucks. And back in 08, we kind of came to the realization that owning the trucks, and that was, uh, that was a, an, an awful deep pond to jump off into. And mm-hmm we really started focusing on growing our, our brokerage. And I was working at a steel company and the steel company actually kind of approached me and said, hey, um, you know, we know that, that we're having a problem finding, finding trucks to, to haul our goods. And we know that you and your wife used to own your own trucks and dabbled in the brokerage. Could she help us out? And that, and that company was my, was my first customer. I, was, I would go to work and she would work in the, uh, in the, at the house there. And yeah. honestly, Chris, our goal just to get started was $250 a week. If she could make just $250 a week, 
that was life altering. That was life changing for us. Yeah. You know, this has been 20 years ago, but um, it's been awfully good to us. And, and here we are today. You know, I've been full time in this freight brokerage business for about 18 years. And we have a very successful brokerage. And we're, you know, sometimes we have just a great time. Other times it's a little tougher than having a great time. But yeah. Uh, I've always been in the, in the traffic, the trucking business, I'll, always. I just, it's one of those areas that I always tell people, once you get in this thing for six months, um, you're not fit for anything else. You can try to get out and you might get out for six or eight months or maybe even a year, but you will always find your way back into trucking somewhere and somehow. Man, it's funny. I say that exact same thing. I say, if you make it six months, you're in it for life. There's, there's very no, true. No turning back. I mean, freight just gets in my blood and you know, it literally is like, I mean, I've just, I come from a family of truck drivers. I've been around this industry my entire life. I mean, my first job that I had was washing the wheels on my dad's semi when he'd come home from uh, being out on the road. You know, I was like five years old and it was, you know, like, again, I've just, I've been around it. Just like the smell of diesel is just nostalgic for me. Anytime I hear a Jake break or I smell diesel, I think of my old man. And it's like, it just gets in me, man. And every time I hear it, cause like we lived on a hill. Uh, in was in northern Wisconsin where I grew up, and every time he'd come home, I'd hear you'd click the Jake brake to slow down to turn into our to the gravel road to come into our house. And every time I hear a Jake brake, now I think of my old man. He, he, like he always drove international trucks, you know. So it's like that's what I just think about every single time, man. It's 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 wild, and you know, getting into this industry, you know, I again just like with everything, man. It's like it's like the, it's like the greatest industry on earth, but it is. It's like so. I always put it like this, 95% of the time, this job goes exactly how it's supposed to. But that 5%, when it goes wrong, it consumes 95% of your day. And it's, in it those, and it's in those moments where you're just like, that's when you question everything. But it's also like, man, I love the chaos and the unpredictability of this industry. Like, I'm, I'm like, it actually like excites me now because like after you've been kicked in the teeth repeatedly, you kind of learn how to navigate through a lot of those situations. Well, that's that's absolutely correct, and and I always tell the only the only constant in the business is the is the non constants in the business, for lack of a better yeah. way to put it. You know, you just you can never you know you can never plan, and, and I think the thing that I love about the business so much is that you know you wake up every morning unemployed. True. And you wake up every single morning as a freight broker unemployed, and I always tell you know I, I have kids, my my own children work for us, and they'll say you know. And they're, I've got them anywhere from 20 to, to 32 that work for us. And they'll say, hey, you know, dad, um, you care if I, you know, take off early Friday and, you know, we're going to go up to Orlando and do this, do that. I'm like, hey, you know the way it works. If you don't hunt, you don't eat. Yeah. And that's the way it is. And, and I love that. I love, I love to hunt every single day. I think that's one of the greatest analogies that I could think of that like sums up entrepreneurship as a whole is you wake up unemployed every single day and you got to hunt if you're going to survive, man, that's, that's right. It's so true. And it is true in freight too. Cause even if you do have consistent business and consistent customers, if you're not out there proactively searching for that opportunity, there's sharks out there who are like, you know, like just because you moved a hundred truckloads for somebody doesn't mean you're entitled to the hundred and first. And I think that that's something that is a big miss in the industry as a whole is they're like, well, I've done everything right. So what? That's the expectation you guys like, there's no value add there. You have to continuously earn your customer's business because if you're not, the second you think you made it, that's the second that the, the real players in the industry come in and sweep up all of your market share. Absolutely. And, and I always tell you know everybody that asks me, you're always trying to replace your best customer because in doing so, you're, you're finding somebody that's better than your best customer and then you're dropping the slough off on the bottom. I always think, you know, depending on your goals, you need, I like, I like keeping a, a, a portfolio of seven to 10 good customers. And yeah. the hardest thing in the world, the hardest thing in the world is to fire a customer. Yeah. But, but we do it. We have to, sometimes we just, you know, we, we, we keep replacing, keep finding. And, and it's really, it's that fight for survival. It's that fight for, for, you know, setting your, your standard of operations and how this is going to work for you. And, and figuring out because you got you got to walk down the same path every single day, and you got to make sure you find customers that are walking on that same path as you are. You can't just you know use your APIs and your EDIs and your TMSs over here, and then 
over here on the other side, you, you have your notebooks and people just, you know, get sending you emails every day with, it, it just doesn't work. If you, Hey, you can, you can create a great living just off the email. Don't get me wrong. But if, if you don't modernize your business, your business will modernize without you and it'll pass you by. That's very true. That's very true, Steve. How has help, how has your experience on the shipper side helped you identify who the right customer profile is? Because I think, you know, a lot of sales reps out there, they get an opportunity and they think that's going to be the account that they retire with. You know, like they're like, oh, that's the one that's going to take me to the mountaintop and everything else. How has that helped you identify who has a solid operation or maybe, they, hey, you know what, this is somebody who I, I don't even think I want to pursue? I think for me, it's uh, this number of loads I take into them. Uh, I look at who their customers are. Um, I'm, I'm picking, you know, loads up and I'm taking them from this plant to, you know, this customer over here. And I, I look to see, you know, kind of the size of that customer. And a lot of my good customers come from my deliveries because I'll always ask, you know, hey, I'm bringing a load into you. Have anything heading out? And for me, a lot of it's that we, we are so big now, Chris, that it, they have got to be technology driven. I, I can't manually do a lot of my, my data entry every single day anymore. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I look to see, see how advanced they are. And the biggest thing for me is do they answer the damn phone? Because so many of these companies, they, they're big and they want, they want, you know, they buy this stuff and they want you to bring it to them, but then they want to answer the phone for your delivery appointments. And I'm like, you know, I, sometimes they'll even offer me outbound loads and I'll say, I, I can't even get you to accept your inbound loads, <laughs> take a phone call. You know, you give me five phone numbers, not one of them works or nobody answers the phone. So, um, you know, we, we have got our own little set of parameters and we stick really close to that. I always call it staying in our wheelhouse. You know, yeah. a lot of people come to us. Now, I will say, that being said, I will say this. I've got customers that I'm, I'm, we're very emotional about because yeah. they were with us in the beginning. You know, they gave us our very first loads. Yeah. And when we were just learning this business, and some of them, even when we were running our own tractors, I mean, they, they gave us our first loads and they stuck with us. And sometimes they gave us loads they didn't have to. And sometimes they paid us when they didn't, the, the kind of money that they didn't really have to, they could have paid it to somebody else, but we always provided good service for them. And they are not your, your high profile shippers. They're not yeah. going to ship a thousand loads a month. They're, you know, they're going to ship a hundred loads a year, maybe. They're yep. going to ship 30 loads a year. You know what? Those guys, I will bend over backwards for them because they stood by me when they didn't have to. And so they don't fit my wheelhouse. Yeah. And I don't want, I don't want any of my agents in my office to have to, to have to fool with them because they're not going to make the big margins on this guy, but I feel a, a kinship to them and I'll take care of that customer myself and my, well, me and my wife will. And uh, you know, those are kind of in-house accounts, but we take care of them we, because they're, they've been with us through the long haul. They, they're, you know, you, you kind of dance with the date that brought you and they're the ones that really danced with us through the tough times. Yeah, no, absolutely. So are you, as a broker, are you more on a niche? Do you specialize in whether it be dry freight, reefer freight? Are you about the specialization and then like a regional based approach? Kind of, how have you taken that? We're 90, we're 95% flatbed. Okay. Uh, we'll do a little bit of, uh, a little bit of, uh, of uh, van freight, not much, no reefer freight. I, I don't know anything. I have people asking, but I have, I have no knowledge of that. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're strictly uh, in the construction type industry. We will haul a little bit of equipment, but we haul a lot of structural steel. Gotcha. Uh, we haul a tremendous number of steel coils and, and all, the, uh, all the suppliers to the plants. And that's what we've built our business off of. And we've walked away from some pretty big accounts just because they were, they were nothing but heartaches, you know, yeah. and, and you just don't have time to fool with them. And I, I, and I didn't need to because, you know, the, the toughest lesson I'll learn, I'll tell you this story. We had, we had one customer, Chris, and th this was, they were my wife's account, Mary, and she, they kind of danced with her too, but they didn't treat her very well. They yeah. kept her stressed constantly all the time. And finally on one Friday afternoon, they called us with an emergency got to have seven trucks and we need them in two hours. Okay. We got them seven trucks in two hours. We did it. And they were all on their way. And they called us 10 minutes before they were all supposed to arrive and start getting loaded and canceled all seven loads. Damn. And I'm like, 
you know, now I've, now I'm going to pay these guys tonus out of my pocket because I couldn't get them to pay it. And, and, and we said, Hey, this is not the way you do business. Is it? You know, and they said, well, if you don't want our business, maybe you should just not have it. And that was a $2 million account. We got, we got essentially fired mutually, but kind of fired from a $2 million account. And you know what, Chris, the best thing that could have happened to us because it brought our focus in on the customers that treated us right. And that allowed us to treat them right. And we've built great relationships with other customers. And now that particular company, they flounder all the time and they've called us, but we have nothing for them. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's honestly, Steve, it's refreshing to hear that approach because I think a lot of people, and I know I'm guilty of this and, you know, for any of you guys who are listening right now, when I refer to a lot of people, I'm referring to myself in most instances, because you know what, I'm open about my struggles in sales and this industry and doing this because it's not easy, you know, like no matter what anybody says, it's, this isn't easy. It's, it's a very cutthroat competitive industry, which a lot of them are, but I, I had that realization early on as well. So I'm like, wait, why am I bending over backwards for some of these accounts? Like I, I show up, I do my job. I provide those solutions that you're talking about. And then like, yeah, the load gets canceled last minute. Oh, we're not paying you a truck order, not used and everything else. You're like, well, wait a second. You don't value the service that I'm providing. I'm just another number to you, you know? Right. And like, And then from that perspective, you do need to take that stance. And I talk about this a lot with whether it be my clients or on some of the content that I create. I'm like, it takes like 25 to 30 shipments with somebody before they really start to identify themselves of what their intentions are, you know? Right. And, I, and, and just, you know, and again, it's like, just like they're judging us on how we perform, you need to judge your customers, your shippers and receivers on how they perform as well. And you need to understand because like as a broker, our carriers are our customers as well. A lot of people have a very hard time accepting that, but that is very true. That's our product. That's our commodity that we sell. And if they're putting our drivers in a predicament to where they're wasting their time on things and, you know, it's like you said, truck order not used and they're not going to pay them and all, everything else, like, that's the conversation you need to have at that time. Like, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to go through with this stuff anymore because there are plenty of shippers out there who do the right thing, who value the services you provide. It just takes a lot of work to get there because I think in, in sales in general, people get stuck with the low-hanging fruit because it's easy to grab. It's easy to be like, oh, hey, I have this account that put me on this email distribution list and I bid on a bunch of freight and I might win one shipment a month. And it's like, is that an account though? Or are you just a quoting tool? You know, it's identifying those things. Well, it is. And I mean, I've actually told some customers, they'd be like, hey, are you going to quote on this load? And finally, I've said, no, I'm not. I don't need to practice. You, I, I quote and I quote and I quote and I quote and I never get a load. I don't have time to mess with you. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need to practice. You know, I'm pretty good at what I do. And, and, and you hit an interesting point about how, you know, the, the truckers sometimes forget that we represent both sides of the fence. And, you know, at the end of the day now, the shipper, they're our customer. Yeah. But the trucker is the ambassador of our business. Yes. And that's what I tell those guys. You are the ambassador of my business. If you do your job, you're the first person that my, that my receiver is going to see, and you're the last person my receiver is going to see that day. Yeah. If you don't do your job, I've got to go and fix everything. Mm -hmm. I got to go and, and make it right on both sides of the fence. Yeah. No, I mean, it's very true. And, you know, and again, it's like, I talk about building up a carrier base and a customer base and everything. And, you know, and that's what it comes down to, to me, Steve, is it, it's, it's like, I've had the, the most success I had as a broker is when I had a solid carrier base, probably about 10 trucking companies that hold about 85% of my freight. I took a very hyper-focused regional approach to it. I, I specialized in open deck and heavy haul for the, you know, the later part of my career. And I identified that I identified that there was a group of carriers that I had hauled in a, on a regional sales approach to it. And it was like round tripping them essentially five, six days a week. And for me personally, it's like, that's where I was able to build out and scale out my book of business with the most sustainability, because to me, we got the service, they got the money that they wanted. Because again, I think like, and this is a, a good thing to take when you're selling freight out there, you guys, is it's asking carriers what they need for a load. You know, if they know their costs, they know what they want on it. Because like, as a broker, we have the volume play. And, and it's like, I, 
I, I'm not discrediting a small trucking company or anything like that, you know, because they make mm -hmm. up 97% of the industry. But at the end of the day, that one or two truck doesn't move the needle for a lot of shippers. And that's why they have truck no. set up. But it's like, as a broker, I can go in there, I can find them 20 trucks in a day, if they need 20 trucks in a day, they tell me what they need as a carrier, I, I'm going to find I'm going to fight for you to get you that money. I'm going to fight for you well, because I, I like my customer is needs me to find those 15 trucks, you know? Well, and I think that's where a lot of the shippers, especially when, you know, we, we like going, we like working with big companies uh, as far as, as far as shipping. And I think that's where they miss the boat a lot of the times because they think, oh, you're not asset based or you can't ship for us. Well, you're cutting off your nose to spite your face because if you're re relying on this regional guy that's got seven loads, seven trucks, all he can give you is seven trucks. If you have 15 loads that need to go, that's that's not going to happen today because he only has seven trucks. Yeah. If you have a, an emergency load that has to go and all seven trucks left yesterday, what are you going to do for the eighth load that has to go today? It's super high. Well, that's where we come in. And, and you know, the, the, the challenge in our business, and, and you know this, is is the double brokering stuff that's going on right now. And and it's it's people that are diving for the basement on rates. And, you know, there's there's always truckers that are more than willing to go down there and play in the basement on the rates. Um, but we try to hold our steady price because we want to we want to charge our shipper the fair rate, and then we always pay our driver the fair rate. Yeah. You know, I get these calls and they're and these these you know double brokers, and you know what they are? They ask they ask for five and six and seven hundred dollars above the the lane yeah. average or above what you've got it posted for, and you're like, come on, man, you don't need have a truck, come on. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, we we just we treat we treat both sides extremely fair, and and I think that. Um, a lot of times we are able to get into into a shipper, even though they require assets, just because of, of our track record. And and I'll, I'll say I, I'm a name dropper. Hey, call so and so over here at this place. Ask him about me, or I'll have them call the shipper and say, you know, hey, you need to use this guy. You need to call him. And we've had a lot of success like that. You know, we're just we we're, we've been in the industry a long time. And like I said, I've sat on every side of the fence. Um, and unlike a lot of freight agents we will actually get out and go travel and call on our customers. Now, yeah. you know, of course, SPI does it and they do an amazing job. But at the end of the day, and I think you've had Mike Micklick on. Yeah. Um, and Mike is one of my dearest friends. I love Mike. Love great Joe guy. Channer, the president of the company. Yeah. Both, Both great guys. But you know what? My customer is not going to pick up the phone and ask Mike Micklick to help him with seven loads. They're going to call me. So I think it's very important that that, that customer knows I've got the support of Mike Micklick but that I'm the guy that he's going to be calling for help with his load. Yeah. And I think that's very important. That's, that's, we try to distinguish ourselves. I call them, I call them kitchen table brokers and there's nothing wrong with somebody that's doing it at home, sitting around their kitchen table with a laptop. Mm -hmm. Hey, that's the American way, baby. If you can do it, have at it. We just try to take a more corporate approach to our business and, and try to meet those needs. Yeah. No, I, I get it, man. And you know, that's the thing is it's like customer facing is something that, you know, I think as a broker, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, the hands off approach, man, I want people to know who I am. I want like, that's where I found the most success out there is like, no, I'll come fly to see you. I'll come out there. Let's let, let's hang out. Let, let, like, because at the end of the day, you know, 95% of the battle is like, people are going to work with you because they like you. Like, that's like the overwhelming majority of the reason why they will set you up is because they like you. It had like, Right. It has very little to do with other aspects of it, you know, and, 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 and to me, I just think like, you got to go against the grain the way that I see it. If everybody in the industry is saying, oh, we're doing it this way, fucking do the opposite because Absolutely. that's going to stick, you know, like I'm all about automation and technology. And you've alluded to that, that you're a fan of that as well. But like, you need to use that to free up your time so you can focus on what actually matters. And that's a, an actual relationship with somebody. You know, like we at the end of the day, plans. somebody has to push that button. Yeah. And I want that person to to know me. And you know what? And, and, and that brings up another point. I want them to like me, but they don't have to be my friend. Yeah. And, that, and that's very important. And, and that's where a lot that's a trap that a lot of people in this business fall into is. And you alluded to it earlier. You know, they'll do 100 loads and then all of a sudden they're gone or whatever. It's not personal. Yeah. This is business. And, and it's just not personal. Unless you live next door to, the, to your shipper, it's, it's not personal. It's all business. And you kind of constantly be, be hunting for more freight 
but maintaining and doing a good job. Sometimes it's not nothing more than stopping in with some a thing of Dunkin' Donuts coffee and some donuts and just saying, hey, just thinking about you guys. You know, several years ago, Chris, um, when I was still with the steel, when I was still in the in employed world, I worked for the steel plant. Um, I had this uh, this guy that he landed my account, tire account, five million dollar a year account. And it took him about a year to get it. I mean, he, he chased it hard and overnight, boom, he got a $5 million account, you know, and, and it turned out to be a, a great situation for him and a great situation for me. I got a lot better service at a lot better price, <coughs> excuse me, but uh, they had a big national tire conference for their company. All their salesmen from across the country came in and they asked me to speak about how to land the big accounts. And, and there were several different things. And I, I talked for about an hour. And um, if you're a football fan, the little side note, so, I, so the day I'm supposed to speak, they told me I'm the second speaker of the day. I'm like, okay, that's fine. You know, and I said, who am I following? Well, you know, I'm from, uh, from Nebraska originally. And they said, oh, well, you're going to follow, you know, Coach Tom Osborne. Huh. And I'm like, yeah, well, that would have been a little bit of that been good information to tell me, you know, three weeks ago uh, <laughs> when I could have still said no. Yeah. But anyway. You know, and, I, and one of the things that I told them, it's very simple things. You know what? If you want me to like you, it doesn't always have to be all about business. We can talk about golf. We can talk about fishing. Don't call me and ask me to go out to supper at the end of the workday and not include my wife. Yeah. You know, I've been, I've been without her all day long. And if you want to please me, recognize the fact that, you know, I want to step outside of work and, and, you know, things like that. I mean, and lunch is great, but a lot of times, you know, people would work through, I worked through lunch. I had a lot of stuff to do and my time then was limited. Um, so it's just, it's, it's just doing all the little small things and just having that respect. Don't bring me gifts. I don't need gifts. I don't need all that crap. You know, it, it's, it's, you're not, you're not going to buy my business. Yeah. Uh, just, Hey, let's talk football. Let's talk golf. Let's talk fishing. Let's talk whatever. And, and don't ask for the business the first visit. That's where guys mess up because you, you, will catch, you will catch a shipper off guard if you go in, look in his office, see what interests him, see, see what he likes, yeah. and, and then talk about that. That's and then great. say, you know, hey, thanks for the time, appreciate it. He's going to be left confused because he'd be like, well, this is a trucking company that just came in. Why, why didn't he ask for my business? Yeah. Because I'm not, I'm not interested in being a one-hit wonder. I want all your business. I want to be your go-to guy and I'm willing to invest the time and the effort to do so. No, it's, it's very true. And like that, that fast sale doesn't exist. And, you know, it does take like the, every customer of substance that I've brought on, Steve took months of prospecting. It wasn't, absolutely. A, it's not a one call close or a two call close. A lot of it was 10, 15 points of contact. The first couple of phone calls are like, I just need them to remember my name because it's right. the voicemail. Uh, they're not going to answer. And if they do answer, we're not interested. All right. Hey, this is Chris. And then all right, I'm going to call back and I'm going to follow up and I'm going to follow up. And eventually they're going to be like, what? All right, let's talk, you know, and, and that's what it has to come down to. Um, but if you do get out there in person, it is that simple, you know, pointing out stuff that's in their office. Like clearly if they have a, I'm a, from Wisconsin, I'm a big Green Bay Packers fan. I got a Green Bay Packers helmet. You know what I mean? It's so like, talk Absolutely. about that. You know, if you're a Bears fan, I'm never going to give you business. No, I'm just kidding. But I'm just like, you know, that's the thing, though, man, is it's like <laughs> finding those little personal touches because at the end of the day, they yeah. know why you're calling. As soon as you yeah. say, hey, this is Chris with such and such logistics, they know why you're calling. All right. Throw them off guard. Don't ask like you're, you're talking about. Everybody goes in and asks for business right away. Don't ask for business. Just just learn a little bit about them. That's, that's all right. you got to do. That's right. If you'll, you'll know how my business goes. If you know about me, you'll know what my philosophies are. If you just talk to me, Yeah. you know, if you're paying attention, if you're paying attention to the nonverbal cues, there's not a lot that I really have to tell you. Yeah. And, and I'm a firm believer in that. No, I'm right there with you, man. So like, what's, how, how have you scaled out your, your company, man? Because I think like, that's one thing that a lot of people are always like, I want to grow, but I don't know how is it through training is it through just recruiting the right people kind of like how, how have you gone through that throughout your career because i'm mean, like you said you've been 
you've been out on your own now do within brokers for 18 years, you know, like you've built yeah. this up. So like, how, like, what have you found from a team building or, and you know, like hiring, like what's worked? You know, it's funny because as big a brokerage as we are, we only have family members that work for us. Oh, wow. Holy shit. And we made that a conscious decision. Yeah. Okay. And, and, I, and I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. Several years ago, we had this, we were on the phone with, I was on the phone with this lady and, and she'd been in the business since God was a small child. I mean, she'd been in it forever. <laughs> and, and she told me a story. She told me about, you know, she spent 20 years, she was a kitchen table broker and she spent 20 years building her business. And she literally sat at her kitchen table and built it. And in 20 years, this woman had built up a decent, you know, $100,000 a year income, which was enough for her. And, but she'd never had a vacation, not, not a vacation a day in her life. And she hired somebody that she trusted and taught him the business. He was going to help her. And eventually, you know, she said, I'll retire and you can have the business. But, you know, she goes on vacation for two weeks, goes to Europe, has the time of her life, comes home. Business is gone. Employee is gone. Computers are gone. Everything's gone. And she had to start over. Oh and it's hard to find people that are that, that care as much about you as your family. And that's why we have stuck strictly to family. And I've never had a sub agent. I, I don't want one. And here's why, because somebody is going to be a sub agent. They're going to be representing me and using my name. And there's very few people that are that I trust to do that for me. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'll use my own name. Thank you. And so we have, we have made a conscious decision, but like I said, we've, we've gone and we've used a lot of technology and there are agencies, Chris, that, that are as big as ours as far as volume. And I, and I'll tell you, I mean, we fluctuate 25 to $31 million a year mm -hmm. in revenue and they'll have 19, 20, 25 employees. There's seven of us. Holy fuck. Good for you, man. There are seven of us. And we are, we are on a constant uh, conference bridge with each other all day. I've got, I've got one in New York City. I've got one in uh, Nebraska. I've got one in North Carolina. Uh, I've got the rest of them right here in Florida with me. Um, sometimes the one in New York City actually comes home to his house in Tampa. And so he has a house and, a, and he has an apartment in New York City. And, you know, they are living an amazing life and, and they're hungry. Because they see, for us, they saw, they've seen where we were in 08, which was flat yeah. on our ass with the economy and everybody else, and what we've built. And they're living, they are living the American dream, Chris. They're living the American ah. dream, and, as I am. I mean, you know, I, we, I, we're just, we're blessed people. But we have scaled up because we've been not afraid of technology, and, and we've been very careful in choosing. Now, there are some people that that I would hire that are not family members that I've known most of my life. And I consider family members, I would hire them. Um, but I don't just hire somebody and let them try it out. Yeah. We, when we, when we go to even one of our, when we go to bring one of our kids to the business, we labor over, okay, do we have enough business to, to, to handle this? Do we have enough business for them to make a good living, you know, and not be hungry, uh, as far as physically hungry. Um, but uh, we don't just, you know, we don't just bring somebody in because they say, hey, I want to join the family business. We'll say that's not time. You know, we, yeah. I don't have the business. I don't feel like I can support you, at, you know, right yet. Stay doing what you're doing. And when we do bring somebody in the business, we've just been doing this a long enough time that we've got the system down. We know how to tell them how to how to talk, how to act. Here's here's your order of operations. Here's what you do. and you know, here's your business. Let's go, let's go for it. And these guys are, are, you know, creating great incomes for themselves. My, my daughter just joined our business, um, two months ago, 22 years old. She is a professionally trained chef and okay. she is an amazing chef. And at the ripe old age of 21 was a sous chef in a five-star restaurant Dang. and just, just hated it. Just, just, and she's a hard worker, but see, I could see, I could see this kid, getting up at four o'clock in the morning and going to the restaurant, even though she didn't have to start cooking till lunch till lunchtime, she was making sure the orders are correct and all these things. So I knew that she's a hard worker. So she joined our business two months ago and I took her up uh, just two weeks ago or last two weeks ago. And she bought her first car, her first brand new car. And she put half of it down in cash. Good. 
Hell yeah. So, yeah. And so we, we've taught them how to work hard. We've given them the system and we, we don't just, you know, I, one, and there just happens to be some SPI uh, officers here this week. And um, one of them was telling me about the way his former employer worked. And I can't say any names or anything, but they would hire 10 expecting one to make it. You know, they would hire a hundred at a time yeah. expecting, expecting just 10 to make it. And, you know, I just, I can't do that to people. I just, I, you know, if you come in and you work for me, I want you to be successful. Yeah. But I want you to be hungry and I want you to be a hunter. Yeah. I'm, I'm right there with you, Steve. And, and to me, it's like, that's the, I'm of the belief, you know, I can teach anybody anything they need to know about trucking, but I can't teach a work ethic. I'm convinced that's right. Steve, that you're, you either want it or you don't, you know, and that's right. if you don't want it in freight. I want you to go and find what you want. Like, I, I, I've just, I've reached that point in my life where I, I like my own mortality is starting to come in. Like I lost my dad about, you know, 10 months ago. And it's now there's like, there's, there's no separation between me and death anymore, you know? Cause like when right. you get your parents there, you're like, Oh, I got time. I don't have time anymore, you know? And, and my whole thing is, is you got to find your fucking happiness in life. That's right. And I'm, I'm just a firm believer. Like f- this industry legitimately is the greatest industry on earth. It's the backbone of the American economy. It's the backbone of our country. And I th- know that this is a very fruitful industry as a whole to work in, but I can't make you want to get up in the morning and go to work. Like you're, you use that example about your daughter. You saw that she was up at 4 a.m. You saw that she was putting in the time, the effort and everything else. You can't teach that, you know, but you can teach somebody how to sell. That's right. Well, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's funny because one of my other kids came to me and he said, you know, what would you what would you say if, if one of us decided we don't want to do this anymore? And I said. I'd say more power to you. Let's find what you want to do. Yeah. You're not going to hurt my feelings. If you don't want to work in the family business, you're just, you're just not. Yeah. And one, one of my sons that actually is it that works for us. And he, uh, he's the one that lives in New York and Tampa. He came to us. He was an entertainer on a cruise ship and just had enough. Yeah. And then he came back to us, uh, you know, a couple of months ago and he said, you know, I'm thinking about maybe doing like once uh, one week, a quarter or one week, a month cruise contracts entertaining and singing on ships. Is that okay? I said, well, yeah, it's your business. It's your business. You're you're not gonna hurt my feelings. If you don't hunt, you don't eat. You know, I, I don't care, but you know, if you're here, you got to be all in, you can't just be part in, you can't, you know, this business, you know, I've had other, other people say, well, could I do this maybe part-time? No, no, this is not a part-time business. I mean, I'm in the office at seven o'clock every morning. And, and then my wife comes in, Mary, she comes in at eight and then I'll get off at five and she'll work sometimes till six. And, but what, what people don't see on the backside is the fact that, you know, we're both answering texts and emails all day and all night. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I had a, I had a guy tell me one time, very successful trucking business has 400 tractors. I think now he told me, he said, you got to hire the right people and you got to be able to get up from your desk and leave. And I said that, you know, that's, that's true. You, you do. But that was when you didn't have email coming in on your cell phones and you didn't have text, and you didn't have, you know, zoom and you didn't have all these things that we have now. If you want to have a successful business, you do what others won't. And I, I tell the kids, you know, you do do today what others want and you can do tomorrow what others can't. Ah, and that's the beauty of this that. business. And, and we get, I mean, in fact, my Mary got a, a, a Facebook message just a few weeks ago from somebody who, you know, my mom told me that you work from home and, um, you know, I'm looking for something so that I can stay home with my kids. And, you know, I've got a kid at home. I've got a one-year-old at home and, I, and we, ha- we have a nanny that works for us that she takes care of her every day, all day long. Because you can't, you can't have four kids hanging around your, your ankles while you're trying to work. This is a business. And yes, we do work from home, Chris. I'm not going to kid you, but nobody's ever allowed to say, you know, I'm at home or we're going home. We're in the office. Yeah. I, we have a house that has got a separate office and I can close it off and it's not part of the house. It's the office. That's where we, that's where we go to work. That's where we make our money. And you know, that, that gives that corporate illusion. That's that I think is very important. If you're wanting to go for the big contacts, you don't want to be sitting at the kitchen table talking about going home. And for God's sakes, when people call me and I, and, and they're looking for loads and I hear the, the screen door slamming on the kitchen, 
I'm like, you know, how serious are you? Yeah. You know, I hear, I hear the cartoons in the background and, you know, I look at your, you know, at your, at your carrier ratings and you're claiming to have 20 trucks bit, but I hear dogs barking and screen doors slamming and, and there's a place for you. It's just not in my world. Yeah. You know, it's just not, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm Chris. I'm not saying it's a bad thing at all. I get it. I'm just saying that it, it doesn't fit my wheelhouse. Yeah. No, oh, man, that makes good. Steve, I, I, you don't have to, I, I understand, you know, like I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm, I'm just like, Hey, you know, that, that might work for you, but it doesn't work for me. You know, it's, right. it's, it's why I like, it's why I had to get out of my house, Steve, because I just reached to a point where I needed to separate. I needed somewhere to go because right. I was, I'm one of those guys where when I wake up, I'm working and it's like, sometimes I like, I wouldn't leave my bedroom for like 14 hours. You know what I mean? Yeah. And no, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's very important. All of my kids that work for me have the opportunity to work from their own home. That's fine. But there are requirements. You've got to have an office and your office is not your bedroom and your office is not your, not your kitchen. You've got to have a dedicated office that you can close the door Yeah, because you have got to leave that business sometime. You have to. And you, and when you get up in the mornings, get dressed. This is not a bathrobe business. This is a serious business. If you want to, if you want to make a bathrobe income, then you're going to make a bathrobe income. If you want to get up and make real money, you're going to get up and you're going to get dressed like you're getting ready to go out and go to work. Wow. And, and that's, that's what we teach and that's what we believe. And that's what we require. And, you know, it's hard at first for them to, to make the distinction between dad and boss. Yeah. And I don't want them to think I'm their boss. I'm their teammate. And that's how we, that's how we approach it. We're all teammates. And, and, you know, we, we talk about, Hey, my partner that I, you know, my partner over here is doing this and, you know, then when there's trouble, then I'm the boss then I'll take care of, of the issues. But, you know, a lot of people get into this business thing and it's an easy way to make a buck. It's not easy. And you know, this Chris, you know, this is not, this is not, it, but it's the hard, it's the hard that makes the business great. Amen. It's the hard <laughs> that my, that my 22 year old daughter can put half of a car down in cash. It's the hard that makes it great. And that's what I love about this business. Dang, man. I, I don't say this often. You got me ready to run through a fucking wall, right? <laughs> and this is, this is fantastic. I, I could talk, I could talk to you for hours, man. I want to be mindful of your time and, and everything, man. I just, I appreciate you, you, you talking about this because like, man, we, we are all, I can tell a lot of our core values align and everything you're talking Absolutely. about right there, man. I'm, I'm very much of that mindset and that outlook. And it, you know, I, I attribute a lot of it to my blue collar upbringing, to my dad making me do the work as a child, you know, and, and it was always, you're not above any job. It doesn't matter what you got to do. You got to show up and put in the work because no one's going to come and do it for you, no matter what. Well, you're absolutely right. And, um, you know, the biggest thing, whether you hire your kids or not, I mean, fortunately, I see, I, I left this little piece out, Chris, my wife and I've been married 32 years. We have nine children. Wow. So, so, I mean, not all my kids work for me. You know, one of my employees is a daughter-in-law that I love. I don't even call her daughter-in-law. We call her daughter because we love her so much. Um, but uh, whether you hire family or whether you don't hire family, the biggest, you, the key to your success is hard work yeah. and surrounding yourself with the right people, people that, that have your back no matter what. You know, uh, there, there's a famous picture of a lion that my wife and I love, and it's a lioness, and and the the big the male lion is behind her, and all you can see is the lion the, the the king's eyes over the top of her head, and it says she does not fear what's in front of her because of what's behind her, and that's how I feel about every person in my office. I don't fear what's in what's ahead of me because of who I've got behind me and surrounding me, and not only the people that I have working in my office, but you know what the folks over at SPI, I mean, they're, they've, they've flown in, they've been here for two days. They're going to be here for another day or two. And, you know, I just, I'm a, I'm an agent for the greatest company, I think in the business. And I, I just absolutely, we're blessed and we love it. And, um, you know, I just, I can't think of a better business to be in. I'll never do anything else because I just, I love this business so much. I, I never, I know, I don't hate my job. I get up and I, I love going to work every day because I, I love the thrill of the hunt and I love what I do. You know, and I get to meet people like you and, and get to see things I normally wouldn't get to see. It's yeah. just a great business. Ah, man, I love it. Steve, how does anybody connect with you, though, man? How, if anybody wants to learn more about or just even want to talk to you, man, like I, I just feel like you have so much wisdom to give out. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, you can uh, you can reach me at uh, at my phone, my office phone, which is 402-379-0244. Don't call before noon Eastern because I'll be too busy to talk. <laughs> or you can email me at S Burrows, and that's B-U-R-R-O-U-G-H-S at SPI3PL.com. S Burrows at SPI3PL.com. Or you can uh, just call SPI's main office and ask to talk to Big Steve and they'll shoot you right over to me. That's awesome. Steve, thank you so much for your time today. If you guys have made it this far in the episode, chances are you're already subscribed. If you're not and you saw value in what we were just talking about, share the show. Because that, again, that's how this is going to continue to grow and evolve and reach more and more people, you guys, is uh, because if you see value in it, your network's going to see value in it as well. I appreciate you guys all so much and we'll be talking to you soon.